Um, I have actually a bit of a, a bit of a study on the word today, but I don't know like um, if you know much about me. I was brought up in a little Aboriginal town. My parents were missionaries in a far west New South Wales in a place called Volcania. And um, I, you know, from a young age as a three-year-old, I remember giving my life to the Lord. My son just gave his life to the Lord as a three-year-old, oh, so it's wow. pretty awesome. So good. And I love the fact that we get to go from generation to generation walking with the Lord. And um, I feel so blessed. I've never walked away from God. I've just had a walk with the Lord from a young age. And um, there are a lot of things. The enemy uses a lot of different things to try to draw us away. Absolutely, there were some trials and tribulations that I went through, but it was through those things that I really discovered the Lord more and more. And I am just claiming that for my kids and my children's children's children, um, because I feel like when you know God, where God is not just a religion, and I'm so thankful for my parents that um, they taught me to know the Lord, not just to be a good person, not just to be a person of morals or of character, not a person of religion, but that we could actually personally know God. I believe that's the thing that sustained me and sustained my family and my children, uh, sorry, my sisters in our walk with God. And, um, you yeah, know, I'm not saying there's, there's no foolproof and there's no condemnation. Hey, I'm not saying any parents who have got kids that are wondering, gosh, but I know the thing that kept me was actually knowing the Lord, having a personal walk with God. Because my walk with my parents was very up and down, very turbulent. But God was so faithful through all of it. And I'm so thankful for the Lord. Amen. When I was, um, you know, and I think that combined with the fact that my parents showed me the kingdom of God and they lived lives um, of no compromise really in that, really for me set a precedent in my life of light and darkness of the kingdom that we're in. I remember walking into my kitchen when I was a little boy and there's a kid that mum and dad are praying for and he's writhing on the floor and demons are coming out of him. I remember walking down the street and there were the drunk alcoholics and then kids would be coming into my parents' home and getting saved and delivered and radically set free. And so just living in a realm um, and in a family, I think that with the, with the knowledge that we could know God personally and then also seeing my parents work out the kingdom work day in, day out, um, it was very, very, it was a massive influence in my life because I saw the power of God as well. And I guess it's something that I'm really hungry to see my kids walk in and know as well, to bring up a generation and, you know, see my children know that they can, that we, we can actually seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And that could be a living reality um, that doesn't end. Amen. Amen. Do you know, I don't believe that there are heydays in the kingdom of God. I think that we can have, definitely I look back on my life and I see great movements, but I feel like every day that we walk with God, we just get to be a heyday with the Lord. Amen. So I wanted to talk to you about friendship with the Lord. Um, I was about 12 years old. I'd give my life to the Lord as a three-year-old. And I was 12 and I was reading through my Bible. 12 or 13, and I came across um, the passage in James. So if you have your Bibles, turn to James verse 22. James 2.22 says this, You see that faith was active along with his works, and his faith was complete by his works. So this is talking about Abraham. And the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God and it was counted for him as righteousness. And he was called a friend of God. My, when I heard that, when I read that, I think I'd heard that passage before. But when I read that, I suddenly had this moment with the Lord where God clearly spoke to me. and said, Jaleel, I want to be your friend. Amen. And um, there's a whole lot of different titles that are pretty amazing through the word of God. But where God puts his name next to someone and says, that's my friend, Amen. I don't think there's anything greater. I could imagine Abraham's tombstone, and they're written, Abraham, from day to day, and then he wrote, then written on it, my friend, God. And I was like, wow, you know, um, 
David was called a servant, a servant of the Lord or a man after God's own heart. But Abraham was this man that God, he barely had, he had, didn't have any writings, he didn't have the word of God written, but he had an encounter with the living God. And this man let go of all his old idols, all his family's ways, and walked with the Lord. And I remember when I, when I had this encounter with the Lord, and I realized that I could pursue pure intimacy with God, that I could actually know Him as a friend, and not just, you know, I used to, you know, I used to sing the songs as a friend of God, but it was always out there. It was sort of like more of a construct, a bit more of an idea than a reality. Does that make sense? And I feel like often in church, we often have these ideas that we sing about, these things that are great, and, you know, we, we but, but actually... We don't always have the connection with faith to make them a reality. Does that make sense? Because mm. faith is what, if we grab a hold of something, it's by faith that then we can actually engage with it and it, it gets pulled into the reality of our lives. And so at that point, I had this faith encounter with the Lord around like, whoa, if I died, if that, like if God was just, God just enjoyed being my friend, that would be the best life ever. Like, I don't think pursuing a relationship with the creator of the whole universe and he actually finds someone who's his friend, like, what, what better thing to do? What, what greater pursuit is there in life? And it really stuck with me. It hit me. And it was at that moment I remember being filled with the Holy Spirit and I started to have audible, like... I didn't hear it, but I started to hear the voice of God speak to me in sentences, and I start to have communion with the Lord. And I remember, like, this first season of just union with God and starting to hear His voice, and it was so different to everything I'd had up to that point. Because up to that point, I I understood the Word. I I mean, as a 13-year-old, we'd read the Bible every morning, and, you know, I had I'd even prayed for people. I'd seen people... Um, you know, I think I've even been filled with the Holy Spirit, had encounters with Him falling on the ground, but just like this beautiful intimacy with the living God. I was, I was just, I was actually so overjoyed that this could actually be a living reality. Amen. And, um, and so I just wanted to go through this basic thing of just basic, but also something that I see so fundamentally often lacking in the body is that people can know, realize that they can actually know the living God. You know, when God made Adam and Eve, he, he made Adam and he said he made him in his likeness and in his image. Isn't that amazing? In the image and likeness of man, and we know that he would come in the cool of the day and he'd walk with Adam and Eve. And, and it goes to question like, well, why are we here? What is our purpose for creation? Why, why, why did God create us and put us on this planet? And maybe you've asked these questions before and you've had them answered, but I truly believe that God needs us, just like a father needs his children. You know, like, I'm okay without my children, but now that I have relationship, I know them, I need them in my life. I need relationship. I don't just need to have sons and daughters. I need to have friends, friendship with my sons and daughters. Because love needs to have something, poor, like it, it needs to be, to have a target to pour itself out on. And because God is love, he created us to pour out his love upon. And, um, and I just wanted to just encourage us, just first off, as we go into this story of friendship and, and um, communion with the Lord, just a couple of things. Um, two passages here. Because we know that since we have sinned, we've all fallen short of the glory of God. Yeah? So mankind was actually made for the glory. Does that make sense? We were made for His glory. But because of sin, we've fallen short of that. But praise God, through the Spirit of God, through salvation, we've been restored to that. Two passages here, in Colossians 3 verse 10 and Ephesians 4.24. Uh, two of the reasons I think that I struggled with actual intimacy with the Lord was because I didn't believe I was compatible with Him. 
Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. Because of my view, the perspective, some of the teaching, it, it came through that I was oil, the Lord is water. Like, who can know the thoughts of God? Like, He's so much bigger and higher, and, and He is amazing, and He's Lord, but also He made us to be compatible with Him because He said He's the vine, and we're the branches. What does that mean? That we can actually be grafted into Him, and we can live off the source of His life, live off the source of His love. But if we don't understand that, we'll never really truly cleave to Him because we'll believe that we are incapable of that actual union while on earth. Two little passages here. Colossians 3 verse 10 and Ephesians 4 24. Talk about this likeness and this image. And the writers of, um, of um, the writer of Colossians, Ephesians, Paul, um, he understood it. They understood the messianic age of restoration because the Messiah would come and restore what was lost. That's what redemption is all about. Mm. So Colossians 3 verse 10 says, Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self. The old self was incompatible with the Lord. It's not possible to have true union and communion with God, with its practices, and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in the knowledge after the image of its creator. See that word image? Image. Renewed in the knowledge after the image of its creator. So we're being restored to the image of God. In Ephesians 4 verse 24, And put on the new self, created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. This is us. This is you as a believer, as a new creation. We have been given the likeness of God in true holiness and righteousness. What did Adam and Eve look like if they were in the image and likeness of God? They were completely righteous and they were completely holy, just like God. How cool is that? So what does that mean? It means that we have the capacity, and I just felt to share that just then. It wasn't actually my notes, but... One of the things that I've found inhibits us is the way that we perceive ourselves. But in Christ, we're brand new and we have capacity to know Him and walk with Him. You know, in Psalms 25, 8 to 15, I was reading it this morning. I'll just read it out. It says, Good and upright is the Lord. Therefore, He instructs sinners in the way. He leads the humble in what is right and teaches the humble His way. All the paths of the Lord are steadfast love and faithfulness for those who keep his covenant and his testimony. For your name's sake, O Lord, pardon my guilt, for it is great. Who is the man who fears the Lord? He will instruct in the way that he should choose. His soul shall abide in well-being, and his offspring shall inherit the land. The friendship of the Lord is for those who fear him. How good is that? Friendship with the Lord. Or the deep counsel of the Lord is for those who fear Him, and He makes known to them His covenant. Amen? What covenant has He made known to Him? His Brit Chadashah, the new covenant, the covenant found through Jesus. Friendship with God is that through the fear of God. Like, I would say that everyone in this room, I really just felt that you, so many of you, the Lord, it's, just, it's like this community is known for its friendship and its union with God. And I feel like more than anything through this season that we're in, He's looking for a people that just know Him. I know. It's good. We can get so sidetracked with kingdom of darkness or what's happening. Even sometimes get sidetracked with trying to build something that He's doing even in His kingdom and not actually just enjoy relationship and communion and friendship with God. And we see the first thing that a friend of God does is he fears God. That's so important. You know, I feel like sometimes um, this, we don't really understand the fear of God. But, but the fear of God really is that we fear God above all the other idols in our world. If you put it in the language of the time of the writer of David where they had the Philistines and the Philistines had their gods and... I don't know, the Malachites, all the dis Amalekites are out there. They're all different people, and they were only as strong as their gods, right? The Egyptians had their gods. 
And so <clears throat> fearing God was aware that he was greater than all the other gods there. He was greater than, than the Asherah. He was greater than Baal. And I feel like in our terminology now, you're like, fear God, that doesn't really make sense. But what it, what it really means is that just as believers, as Israelites at that time, we knew that our God was greater than all of them. And so we would follow him 100% and not bow our knee to anyone else. Because he is more powerful. He's more worthy. He is actually Lord of Lords and King of Kings. And so in a world today, maybe we don't see the gods around us that are actually pressing in. The gods of... Um, Oh man, there's a heap of gods that we're in. We live under in this world that we're in. One of them is the fear of man. How people, what people think about us. People exalt their name above the name of God. There's there's the fear of like ease that we live in, where we're just like this world, this Western society is all about making sure that we have enough to provide for ourselves so we can have an easy and safe and, and a carefree life. Right now, there's a, there's a God of, of the medical world which is getting shaken by coronavirus. So we have no idea up to this point. We, we almost put trust in the medical world above God. But that's getting shaken in it because it's causing a disturbance. But we know that our God is greater. He's above corona. We know who wins. Jesus wins the life of corona. Amen. And so we see people who are friends of God know who he is. They understand his power and they're in submission to that. And they're, they're willing to take the risk because it's actually not a risk anymore because they know they're God. When you step out in faith and you go on a journey, but it's, it's like a kid jumping out of a tree. Like he, he's done it so many times with his father. It's not even like there's no, there's no fear even jumping in his heart anymore because he just knows he's going to get caught because he knows his father. So good. Yeah. And the fear of gravity is not as great as, as his fear for, for his father. Does that make sense? He knows his father's going to catch him. So all the other fears drop away. And so a friend of God is one who fears the Lord, who knows the Lord. And the, the, the Bible is actually just full of promises of God's love for you. His promises sure. for you. The Psalms 91 is actually, it doesn't need to be mediated. It's a direct promise to you. That's right. You don't need me to speak it over your life for it to be a reality. Jesus, the spoken word speaks it over you, declares it over you. Right. Amen? Amen? And then through faith, through the fear of God, we grab a hold of it and it actuates in our lives. You know, this word um, <clears throat> that's used here, friend, is the word sod. It means a company of persons. It means intimacy, a secret place, a consultation in this Psalms 25. The Lord enjoys intimacy with his people. Amen. He enjoys union with his people. In 2 Chronicles 20 verse 7, just going back to a couple of passages around Abraham, it says, Do not you, Did not you, our God, drive out the inhabitants of this land before your people Israel and give it forever to the descendants of Abraham, your friend? I love that. And then Isaiah 41 verse 8, But you, Israel, my servant, Jacob, whom I've chosen, the offspring of Abraham, my friend. He just continually, he, God's using it in first person. He's, it's the way he describes Abraham. You whom I took from the ends of the earth and called from its furthest corner, saying to you, You are my servant, I've chosen you and not cast you off. And the word here that he uses for friend is the word ahav. It's, it means to be affectionate. It's uh, Ahava means love. It's actually the only word in Hebrew. There's only one Hebrew word for love. Ahava, Ahav, to love. Lovers, friends, um, lovely, kind. God is calling. He's like, Abraham, the lovely. Uh, Abraham, my lover. That's what he's calling Abraham. And you know, the beautiful thing about Abraham um, that I was thinking about was that he... He was a man of faith well, well into his old age. Amen. That's good. You know, 
I, I feel like there's a lie that, that I've heard, and I've even heard it come through like family, and that you know they had their height, their heyday in their thirties and forties, mm. and 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 now it's sort of over. And but that that means that your heyday has got everything to do with your performance and nothing to do with intimacy. But if our pursuit is friendship with God, then that is only going to grow and grow and grow and grow and grow. And we, we see that with Abraham. We see Abraham. I mean, he was quite old when he was called to go to another land. Beyond child age bearing. And then he goes to the land. He's called by God, not in, in a th as a 30 year old, but older with his, with his wife. And, they, and he goes off to the land. And then, you know, it was, I was in... Was Sarah 90 when she bought her child? I think it was. So Abraham was like over 100 or something like that. When they had their son. Yeah? This is a friend of God. This man that actually Paul uses in Romans to teach us about like faith and the new covenant was over 100 years old. Amen. That's good. This friend, this friend that shaped Actually, what, we, what all of us have been grafted into, what you've been grafted into as sons and daughters of Abraham, came from this man who was over 100 years old. And then how old was his son when he was tested by God to sacrifice him? Oh, maybe 13, 12, 13, 14, yeah, we don't know. Probably. Under the age of 18, probably. So there he is. There's Abraham as a 100, let's say 120 year old, climbing a mountain, Mount Moriah. Now, this man is not perfect when we think about a friendship with God. There's, he, if the Bible doesn't hide his issues of the fact that twice he tried to lie about his wife um, because he was afraid of his own life. But yet, when it came to the things of God, when he heard the voice of God on things, he was just a continual yes and amen. That's good. Now, I just, I just feel like, I, I, for me, the Lord just has been boiling back my life just to the concentrate of of intimacy with the Lord. And, I mean, I'm only, I'm just about to hit my 40s. In three years' time, I'll, I'll be hitting 40. So I'm still a young man compared to most of you guys. Remember when you were 40, some of you? Yeah? <laughs> Steve shaking his head. <laughs> oh, but I have been around church enough to see the froth and bubble and to see that there is a lot of stuff that is spoken, jazzed up meetings that... Um, and friends that just are not walking with God, that don't know Him personally. Youth group meetings that were wild, but people are not actually doing anything they committed to. Like, <clears throat> no content. No content. No depth. No real tangibility. And, and I can tell you, like, I, I, you can probably count on your hands personally people that you know who walk with God. Hmm. And um, some of my greatest heroes that I actually get to live with are over the age of 60. Mark's one of them, Sue. I had some amazing, uh, Russell and Ruth Briggs, they work with Pioneers. Dorothy's becoming one of my heroes. Um, there's another couple, the Ratcliffs. And you see these people, and they have not toned down for the gospel. They have not written themselves off because their walk is everything to do with intimacy with the living God. And, and if it really, what is it? It's, it's fearing God. It's, he goes on to speak about it here, and we'll look at some passages. But walking with God and being a friend of God is, is fearing Him, loving Him. But, but ultimately, it's being a yes to Him. It's, it's just hearing His voice and being a yes to the Lord. Okay. You know, Abraham took his son, sacrificed his son Isaac. Boom, didn't question it, just went and did it. And this man, that act of being a yes accounted to him as righteousness. And do you know why that is? Is because righteousness was restoration of mankind back to its original design. That's what righteousness means. In the Hebrew, righteousness is, we, you know, you might have heard it as... Um, being made right standing before God. But righteousness in Hebrew, tzaddik or tzaddikah, is, is, a, 
is mankind being recalibrated back to God's original design of how he was supposed to be. Being made right. Humanity being made right. And mankind will be, will be made to be in deep union relationship with him and to be obedient sons and daughters of the living God. A yes to his word. When he asks us, yes, yes, yes. That's what we see Jesus doing. He says, I do nothing of my own. I only do what I see my father tell me to do. My authority is not even my own. My own. It's what my father's given me. And he shows us what it looks like for God to be in the image of man. In Colossians it says that Jesus is the image of the invisible God. He's also known as the second Adam. The first Adam, made in the image and likeness, fell, questioned, walking in disobedience, fell away from relationship with God because of sin. Remove that, what is it? Intimacy with God, being a yes to Him. I don't know, like, I feel like it's not that complicated, is it, really? What would our lives look like if we just pursued intimacy? And I'll I put it out there. I, I know the biggest, distra- the biggest thing that takes me from knowing the Lord now. It used to be sin. Sin was like the big thing, I just like temptation. But when I realized there wasn't a sinner, that was gone, that got taken away. So the next thing that he takes us away with is distraction. It's the classic distraction. You just screen, smoke screens here and here, try to look at stuff. It, I see so many believers um, who know so much stuff, they're distracted by the age that we're in, or they're distracted by certain theology or being right, but they don't actually know the living God. That's right. And, um, man, I feel like this age that we're coming into, because we're going to be this beautiful, spotless bride. That's right. Oh, man. What does a bride want to do? Does she need to know everything about her husband? Does she need to... Does she need to be, um, I don't know, well-versed in terminology so she's loved by him? Or does she just pursue intimacy with him? Pursue love. Set herself apart, just growing in love with the one that she's going to give herself to. And that is a season that... And she keeps herself and, and his word is her life and her source. We see that in James 22, right? James 2.22. It says, you see that faith was active along with his works. His faith was complete by his works. And the scripture was fulfilled saying, Abraham believed God and was counted him as righteousness. And he was called a friend of God. What's that talking about? His faith led to him being a yes to God. That's friendship. It's very simple. I know it's not a complicated message, but... For me, it's so profound if I can just reduce my life down to that. You know what? I remember a couple of years ago, it was about two years ago, I was just on my knees and I was just got hit by the love of God because, you know, we nothing can actually separate us from His love. So if you turn your affections to Him right now, you can encounter His love because it's right there. Don't have to drum it up. It's being poured out towards us through the Spirit of God, it says. And I was just enjoying union with the Lord, and and I just got so hit with His love, and I just said, God, I, I can't, I, I, I love you so much, I, I couldn't, I can't live without you. And he, and he said to me, you know what He said to me? He said, same here, I love you so much, I couldn't live without you, so I died for you. Okay. You know, he, he just loves us. He loves us so much. I've just enjoyed this new season that we've come into with Street Peace. Um, the last six weeks have been quite phenomenal. And I just want to thank many of you because I know that you've been praying for us. And we are really riding on the Spirit of God that is coming through your prayers. And, but the beauty of it is that The beauty of it is that kids are actually um, experiencing relationship and the kindness and the love of God. And the thing that rocks me so much is that these kids, um, 
oh man, he's loving on the unloved. You know, like, I've experienced love, but I experienced great love through my family, through my, as, you know, my parents loved me so well, but you meet these kids and they've experienced anything but love. And then they're encountering the love of God. And it, it's just like, it just blows them away. He's so kind. He's so lovely. He's so beautiful. We had, um, we had our first meeting on Thursday. I oh, know, um, yeah, on Thursday this week online. And we just did six weeks. And um, Steve was there. And, man, he's been, Steve, you've been such a blessing, eh? Chat to Steve if you haven't, if you want to hear more about what's happening with Street Peace. But, um, you know, the six weeks which just grew and grew and grew. But what also grew was the presence of God grew and grew and grew. And then I started getting scared. Because you don't actually, when the presence of God rocks up, like he's actually in control. And what's that called? It's called the fear of God. Well, what is he going to do? Well, what, is that, what happens when your meeting's just like God takes over? It gets scary. It's the fear of God. It's the, what is going to happen? And... Um, and so after six weeks, we're just like, yeah, let's disciple these ones. We've got six weeks now to disciple these ones that have encountered him. And so we jumped on and, and we had one girl who showed up from all the good kids. But this one girl had an encounter with the Lord the last three weeks. She gave her life to the Lord. And, and so there, across the screen, she, this, there's this demonic spirit is oppressing this girl. And um, you can see her just twitching and flaying, flailing, like you see if you've seen demonic stuff before. And then very just beautifully, the Lord just like ministered to her. It wasn't crazy. There was no screaming. And she just got free. Just God encountering Amen. humanity for intimacy. And the words that are coming out of her mouth are like, just pure things like, wow, I don't think we even realize how great and big God is. Like, he's more powerful than we can imagine. And her neck sore, and Jesus just heals her neck on the spot. And she's just like, she's just, it's, I, I think sometimes we forget that and we put ourselves in the way of trying to be something that he wants to be with humanity. Mm. And when we come back to the fact he just, he wants to be around a people that he feels comfortable with. Amen? Like, he's, we've made room for him in our lives. There's a big yes in our lives to him. So good. In Matthew 7, verse 21, the Bible says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. And I know that the seasons that we're coming into, there will be a, there's going to be a great division in the body. And the division is not going to be over theology. It's going to be division over those who are saying yes to God and those who don't. And I think that's sometimes really difficult for us where we've come from a very... Um, oh, what's the word? Evangelical background. Where the, you know, Luther really laid it out that whole salvation was belief, which it is, like it's by faith that you're saved. But sometimes we just swing to that perspective and we don't realize that faith must outwork, as we see in James, through action. Absolutely. And it's not just action about being good people, like, that's the thing, is like, when we look at Abraham's life, he wasn't always morally sound. But he heard the voice of God and he was a yes to that. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And I feel like sometimes I see so many people in the church who are so morally sound. Yeah, you know, they don't smoke, they don't swear, they don't drink. Some are like, some are like so classic they have no character left. Like it's just like they're just following some rule books. And, and I don't mean that in a bad way, but like if you see some of the people that God grabbed a hold of through the Old and New Testament... They weren't all morally sound. Like, look at Jesus' disciples. Like, they were, like, journeying with him. And he was called to travel with people who thought it was all right to genocide a city. Mm. You know? Let's call out on fire and just, like, see the Samaritan city destroyed. But what they were was a yes to the voice of Jesus. Come, follow me. It's true. And um, it really, I just, I just feel like, 
um, in this friendship with the Lord, there's only some things of relationship and intimacy that you can encounter here with Him when you are a yes to Him. You can only go so far in your intimacy in your bedrooms or in worship services, but it's when you start to step out and be uh, He is, I fear God above everything else, I'm going to be yes to Him in this circumstance that the reality of God starts to break out in a new way and he reveals a whole new side of his face to us. Amen. And I feel like we're just stepping into that season as a body like never before. I feel like it's always been there. Friendship with God has been since Abraham before that. That's, God has been pursuing that with mankind. But I feel like with the bride that we're coming into a season where that is really going to be the defining factor of the bride. We're going to be known by the love of God, by the love that we have for one another, we're going to be known because we're just radical yeses to Him. That's great. Amen? I had this passage out of Job 29, and we know Job went through some pretty tough stuff. Yeah. And I actually feel like Job was always in friendship with the Lord, no matter how good or bad it is. But Job 29 one says this, and Job again took up his discourse and said, Oh, that I was in the months of old, as in the days when God watched over me, when his lamp shone upon my head, and by his light I walked through darkness, as I was in my prime, when the friendship of God was upon my tent, when the Almighty was yet with me, when my children were all around me. I, I just encourage you that all of us may have had times where it's just like, Oh man, I remember those good times with the God. We do a bit of a Job thing, we look back and go, and I've heard it with people that I've journeyed with where it's like, it's the place they go to, but it was about 40 years ago. And relationship with God is for the present. He's the I am. And, and I feel like there is endless realms of the Lord, encounters with the Lord that we have not even met as we go through the journey of knowing Him and pursuing Him. In Amos 3, 6, it says, For the Lord does nothing without revealing his secrets. That word sod is again, it's the, it's the divine, um, um, oh, what was that word sod? It means, um, divine counsel, intimacy, consultation. It's that word there. Revealing his secrets to his servants, the prophets. Amen. I feel like we're coming to a season where the prophetic is going to really increase again. Um, looking at Joel 2, verse 8, um, sorry, 28 and 29, it says, And it shall come to pass afterwards that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. And that's what we're looking at. Looking at the prophetic, you link that in. Well, that's divine intimacy with God. That's what the Spirit of God allows us to have. And then it goes on to say, your old men shall dream dreams. It's so interesting you're having dreams, Mark. But I just encourage you that there is no dissociation with the outpouring of the Spirit upon a particular age group in the generation. It's the kids, it's the, it's the old, it's the young. In fact, um, it says, your old men shall dream dreams, your young men shall see visions. Even on the male and the female servants in those days, I'll pour out my Spirit. There's going to, the, the Lord is, I feel like, um, I actually feel like for the body to really work well, we need the old to carry the dreams so the young men get the visions. Oh. And I feel like if we have visions without dreams, then we will carry purpose without wisdom, because wisdom comes through the dreams. And I just really wanted to encourage you guys as, this in this community because I feel like you have such a part to play in carrying the wisdom of God to the next generation as the next generation carries the vision of God, the dreams of God. Because dreams are all about, you know, you, dreams are about, you, know, you read through the Old Testament, the dreams of what Pharaoh had or um, Joseph interpreted was all about not just the situation that's taking place, but how to work through that situation and what God's doing. If He's revealing things, then we need to hear it. And I just encourage you just to completely remove any mindset of your time is up because you're friends with the Lord. That's great. 
And if you're friends with the Lord, then you're a yes to God, because that's what it looks like. And when you're a yes to God, your life always looks extraordinary. It's always in the realm of the supernatural. That's right. Amen? It's always, it's always way bigger than what we could ever do. It's always beyond what we could ask or think. It's, we get to walk on His shoes and it's out of control. And I just, I just encourage you, like, yeah, as you, because I feel like this room is full of people who just know the Lord. Now look at you, Ron, I don't really know you, but I can see that you're a man that knows the Lord. You have communion and friendship with God. And I was going to say that you guys are in your prime, just like Abraham was in his prime. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Cool. Well, let's, um, let's just commune with the Lord.